Muy buenas noches a todos y bienvenidos. Estamos muy emocionados contando los minutos para que llegara este día y esta hora, porque hoy tenemos eh, un, un hito en la historia de la astronomía, de, eh, por lo menos en la Universidad Galileo y probablemente en las comunidades astronómicas de Guatemala. Eh, quiero darles la bienvenida a esta plática, una plática extraordinaria, eh, una plática que, que, que pretende darnos más crecimiento en conocimientos tanto científicos como culturales. Y hoy eh, es así que hemos conseguido por primera vez una conferencia de un astrónomo de la India. Él está conectado directamente en Mangalore, eh, al otro lado del mundo, y es el profesor Atul Vat. De, él, él es profesor de física en una de las universidades más prestigiosas del país. Es eh, muy versado en astronomía india y también ha escrito libros de texto para los estudiantes de astronomía. También ha estado organizando webinars. Es una persona muy dinámica. Organiza webinars, observaciones, y sus webinars son muy impresionantes. Recientemente ha estado colaborando con Estados Unidos, con eh, The Southern Maine Astronomers en Portland, Maine, y ha estado interactuando con ellos por la misma razón que está hoy interactuando con Guatemala, con los astrónomos de Guatemala, con la comunidad astronómica de Guatemala, que es intercambio cultural y científico relacionado con astronomía un hito para la Universidad Galileo, para el Instituto de Astronomía. El profesor Bat está involucrado en acercar la astronomía a todos, al público, a sus estudiantes por igual. Eh, y, de es, y de hecho, por eso es que él aceptó eh, esta conferencia. O, o, él usualmente organiza programas de observación del cielo allá en India, en escuelas, en universidades, para que sus estudiantes y el público se involucren en astronomía. Entonces, esta charla va a ser en inglés, precisamente, eh, con, por el tema del idioma. Y entonces, permítame presentar y darle la palabra al profesor Atul Bhatt. Welcome, professor. Welcome, professor Atul Bhatt. Welcome to Galileo University in Guatemala and to the Astronomy Institute. We are very glad to have you here. And we are uh, excited about your uh, conference, your lecture, and let us give us let us give you the the word so you can start. Well, welcome. I think you are on mute. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Edgar. Thank you, everyone. Buenos dias to all of you. Buenos dias. <laughs> it's good to say uh, that you are in the morning and we are at night here. Yes. We had 12 hours, right? Difference? 12 yes. hours and a half? Yes. So it is very... Uh, It's incredible that uh, you are in the other side of the world in the next day. You, for you, it's uh, Friday now. Yes, it's um, Friday. We, yeah. <laughs> here is yes. Thursday night. So, yes. Please go ahead and welcome. Oh, thank you. Um, okay. So, thank you, everyone. Uh, today, I'm here to talk about astronomy in India. So when I talk about astronomy in India, because we I'm speaking from another part of the world, uh, we have a totally different culture. You've got the Incas, you've got the Mayas, you've got beautiful astronomy stories there. Whereas in India, we've got the same, but in a different taste. So I'll be talking about the same thing. We will talk about astronomy in India, whatever we have seen, whatever the Indians have seen in the past. Along with it, I will also uh, show you the current scenario of astronomy in India because uh, things may be different. So in India, we have got uh, various observatories 
We've got uh, many structures from medieval India, which is also I'll discuss. And of course, uh, what the world has heard a little bit about, the ancient astronomer, astronomy in India. So this is going to be the content of my talk. So astronomy in India has been covered in three parts to you today. That will be the ancient astronomy, the medieval, and the modern Indian astronomy. So to begin with, in ancient India, if you just Google India, you'll come across the word Vedas. Vedas are scriptures, the ancient Indian scriptures, uh, similar to the Mayas and the Inca writings. In India, Vedas uh, are certain scriptures that mention a lot of astronomy. So if you go through the astronomy mentioned in the Vedas, you'll come across uh, nakshatras, that is asterisms, shapes in the night sky, maybe one star, maybe a group of stars. You'll come across zodiac constellations, the constellations where the sun will pass through. You'll come across lunar months. So we've got names for the lunar months. We've got names for the certain period in the lunar month. And then we've got calculation of eons. So, uh, of course, the world heard about how the world would come to an end in 2012 because of the Mayan prophecy and so on and so forth. Similarly, in the Indian uh, history, we've got uh, calculations of how long will the universe last and so on and so forth. So those are also mentioned based on astronomical calculations in the Vedas. We've got a whole new description of the Big Dipper constellation. So when we talk about Big Dipper constellation, we look at a giant bear. It's basically a part of the Ursa Major constellation. So the Big Dipper asterism, the seven stars in India have a different meaning. So what you see here are the seven stars. And in India, we call these the seven sages or rishis. So these seven rishis are the people who gave us knowledge, who gave us everything that we know from the ancient times. In fact, they were the authors of the Vedas. So in India, we believe each of these stars represents one rishi. And of course, we know Big Dipper is going to tell us about um, pointing towards the North Pole and so on and so forth. In India, we were also uh, aware that the star Mizar and Alcor are actually two stars. It was visual binary. So what you see, when you see through the naked eye, unless you have the perfect vision, you would see these two stars together as one star. But in India, ancient Indians saw these two stars and they also realized that over ages, over centuries, as the stars move apart, as one star moves apart from the other, Mizar and Alcor always remained the same. So we confirmed that they were binary stars. So this was mentioned in the Vedas. In fact, in India, this is actually a custom that the husband, when they get married, uh, the husband shows the Mizar and Alcor star to the wife. Of course, it's a custom. They show it in the daytime. They can't really see the stars. But it's a custom where we say, we are going to be together like Mizar and Alcor. Or in India, we call them Vashista and Arunbhuti. Vashista was the uh, sage, the Mizar star. And his wife was the small Alcor, Arundhati star. So this is the belief in India. And then again, in the Vedas, they have also mentioned how uh, the nearest star to the uh, uh, sun is in the southern skies. And they call this Mitra. If you match the coordinates mentioned there, we will come across the, const uh, the star of Alpha Centauri. We know that Alpha Centauri is the closest star that we can see with our naked eyes. Proxima Centauri is a little closer, but we cannot see it with our naked eyes. So the uh, astronomy in the Vedas mentions that Alpha Centauri is a friend of our sun. It's very close to our sun. So that's Mitra. Mitra is the word for friend in Sanskrit. So to realize that Alpha Centauri is the closest star we have, that must be uh, something very important. Along with it, uh, in the Vedas, we have also observed five visible planets. Along with the five visible planets, we have uh, deified the sun and the moon as well. So you can see the images here. These are the deities or the gods we have given for each of these 
नाइन ग्रहास सो वेन आई से ग्रहास राइट जी आर ए एच ए ग्रह आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट सेलेस्टियल ऑब्जेक्ट ऑफ विच फाइव आर प्लैनेट सो यूव गॉट मंगला हियर दैट इज मार्स यूव गॉट बुधा हियर राइट दैट्स मर्किरी यूव गॉट गुरु दैट्स जुपिटर यूव गॉट शुक्र दैट इज शनि सॉरी यूव गॉट शुक्र दैट इज वीनस एंड देन यूव गॉट शनि ओवर हियर दैट सैटर्न यूव गॉट सूर्य दैट इज द सन and the chandra that is the moon so when you look at these you realize that ancient indians in the vedas saw the celestial objects in the night sky and this kind of paints a picture of a geocentric theory where earth is in the center and everything else moves around us so you've got the five uh, planets and then the sun and the moon but there are two more uh, deities or grahas mentioned over here that is the rahu and the ketu so the imagined uh, points in the sky where when the sun reaches that particular point the sun would disappear or the sun would appear half like it was being eaten by some so they imagine the lunar nodes as objects that were not visible but that hid the sun the sun hid behind them or as you can see in this image over here it was eating the sun so this was something important right so when the sun reaches this point if it is disappearing that means there may be something important there so they named it rahu and ketu in fact there is a whole mythology behind it where rahu and ketu are from the same person it was the same demon and uh, there was a small conflict and the god severed the head the chopped off the head of uh, rahu ketu and the head is now called rahu and the body is now called ketu as you can see over here there's no head to ketu and there's no body to rahu so these are demons as we can personify them but in astronomical sense these are nothing but the lunar nodes the descending and the ascending nodes so we all know in astronomy that when the sun and the moon reach the node the lunar node they are perfectly aligned with the earth and when the moon comes in front of the sun we cannot see the moon but the sun will disappear the sun may appear partially eaten so that is how they imagined uh, the lunar nodes in ancient india along with this we have some more scriptures although uh, the validity of the scriptures may be debatable by many but majority of india believes that these are true events and of course they may be true events because the description mentioned in these scriptures are very 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 precise in fact one of the important scriptures of india if you just simply google india you'll come across the words ramayana and mahabharata so in ramayana when prince rama you can see the protagonist is over here when prince rama was born the author describes the night sky i put a small translated verse over here which mentions that rama was born on the ninth day of the month of chaitra it's one of the months lunar months we have in india so he was born on the ninth day of chaitra and on that day the ruling star or the nakshatra was punarvasu i will come to that in a while and then during this time sun mars jupiter saturn and venus were at their highest positions and jupiter and moon were in the constellation of cancer so you see it's very precisely described how the sky looked when prince rama was born so using this many people have tried to find the date exact date when rama was born but then uh, so far we have not found the right date we've got multiple people giving us uh, different dates so on and so on. similarly in the mahabharata it also mentions that before the war the night before the war we had an eclipse the the moon turned red so it's a lunar eclipse and then on the 13th day of the war mahabharata is basically a scripture that describes a war between two families and the war went on for 18 days so on the 13th day of the war suddenly in the sky there was disappearance of light there was darkness of course today we know such darkness happens when there is a solar eclipse so you may you see that the time is mentioned there was a lunar eclipse 
And then on the 13th day after the lunar eclipse, there was a solar eclipse. So such events, uh, I mean, it's easy to imagine them, but to imagine them with such precise uh, uh, details, that is what leads to people finding the real dates. But this is, this is the culture in India. Astronomy is embedded in our scriptures, in our stories, in our mythology, and in reality. Also in the Mahabharata, they mention one small puzzle. They say that the, the star Abhijit fell from the sky. I will explain this in a while. Uh, but this, these are the kind of things that are included in India. Then when we talk about the scientific aspects of Indian astronomy, leaving aside religion and the scriptures and the mythologies, uh, there was an ancient astronomer called Lata who wrote the Surya Siddhanta. Call him Lata, Lata, whatever it is. So he wrote a very uh, important treatise uh, called the Surya Siddhanta. This is believed to be the prime uh, astronomical text in India. This is where uh, the mathematical aspects of astronomy began. It is not simply describing the stars and the moons and uh, the planets anymore. It was precise calculations because Surya Siddhanta discussed trigonometric calculations that will help us in astronomy. It spoke of the Earth's axis being tilted. It spoke of how the Earth is spherical in shape. It spoke of uh, solar and lunar positions and their calculations predicting eclipses. It spoke of planets' characteristics. We, when we look at Jupiter throughout the year for a small period of time, maybe a, uh, two or three months, Jupiter moves in the reverse direction. Today we know, uh, call it as retrograde motion. This was also uh, mentioned in Surya Siddhanta. So uh, the planet characteristics, how when they move forward, when they move backward, how long will be, they be visible? Uh, Venus being visible for uh, 18 months uh, and then disappearing from the sky. So these kind of things are discussed. And again, uh, Surya Siddhanta is the base textbook for all the calendars that we have in India today. So we have two types of calendars. I will come to that in a while. So these are all based on the calculations mentioned in the Surya Siddhanta. What you see in the cover here is a later uh, revised book written by A.K. Chakravarti, but the original text, uh, some of it was lost and some of it survived, and this is what we have to do. There's another very important text known as the Parashara Tantra. Again, what you see here is a modern version of the book written by R.N. Iyengar, but Parashara was a Vedic sage, and he made very important contributions to uh, Indian history. And one of the very important contributions being, he mentions in his uh, writings that Canopus, the star, in India we call it Agasthya, the star Canopus became visible for the first time in the year 3100 BCE. What do you mean by Canopus being visible for the first time? Of course, for us in South India or for people around Guatemala, Canopus is a visible star in the southern skies. But as you move towards, India is a, a long country, so as you move towards the northern parts of India, as you move towards the northern states in India, Canopus reaches the horizon. And for a long time, Canopus was not visible from the northern states in India. So the fact that Canopus becomes visible in detail, Parashara discusses how the earth precesses, or the, we call it today as the precession of the equinox. So the earth wobbles like a top, and because of this, uh, the pole star moves. So you can see here, I've put an image where you've got a circle in the sky that is uh, plotted by the axis of the earth. So right now we have uh, the earth's pole here near Polaris. So a period of around 27,000 years, the earth will wobble and complete one complete circle. So when this happens, even the southern skies will change. So uh, Canopus was not visible earlier. That means the Earth was somewhere here. It was pointing somewhere here. And then as the Earth's axis points towards this direction, as it processes, Canopus became visible in the evening skies. And also, what I mentioned in the Mahabharata, that Abhijit, the star Abhijit fell. The idea is, we call the star Vega as Abhijit. So the Mahabharata mentioned that Abhijit fell from the sky, which means it moved from its usual position in the sky. 
that can only happen if that star, if that star had a fixed point in the night sky and you realize because of the precession of the equinox uh, today we are in uh, we have polaris as the pole star but in another 12000 years 12000 12500 years vega will be the pole star and we can say the same in the reverse direction so 12000 years ago vega was the pole star not exactly vega but it was very close to being uh, the celestial pole so it looked like the entire night sky revolved around vega so vega moved from that position vega fell from the skies is what has been mentioned so these are the uh, indian things we have so when I, when i talk about uh, astronomy in india about surya siddhanta and so on and so forth we'll come across some very familiar names of course i cannot cover all of them but here are the popular uh, indian astronomers that have contributed a great deal to our knowledge first we have got aryabhata and aryabhata is famous for his uh, the book called aryabhatiya uh, that's basically the uh, observations made by him in which he has discussed planetary motion he has calculated planetary motion like i told you the precise uh, duration of retrograde motion uh, venus being visible uh, mercury being visible and so on and so forth and aryabhata talks of a geocentric theory although there's a small debate going on about this uh, people do mention that some of the aspects of aryabhata are mentioned a uh, heliocentric theory but most of the observations in aryabhata uh, seem to be geocentric so we you can say he believed in a theory that was pretty much a ge- geocentric theory so the earth was in the center and everything else moved around the earth he also explained eclipses in very um, uh, with the smallest details he calculated the time period the sidereal day sidereal year so he calculated the time period for a year a month a day and so on and of course uh, for mathematics he is very famous for having invented the number zero and approximating pi with a very precise value along with aryabhata we have bhaskara who uh, is credited for the uh, discovery of trigonometric functions in indian texts so bhaskara was the one who approximated the sine functions and he also studied the stars and planets and so on and so forth he calculated the position of the stars he calculated the position of the planets and eclipses just like aryabhata did but he just improved on the work and then we have a very famous uh, contributor to indian astronomy that's varaha mihira varaha mihira was uh, uh, instrumental in calculating time for indians today because he was the one who was believed to have brought the idea of the zodiac belt or the zodiac constellations from the greek knowledge so varaha mihira calculated precise duration of what we call today as a day right i'll i'll discuss that when we discuss the calendar varaha mihira also studied the eclipses and planetary motion and so on and so forth so these are uh, three astronomers that come to our mind when we say indian astronomy of course there are many 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 more people uh, who have contributed little by little and these three astronomers have uh, summarized all of it and give a uh, painted a better picture for us all so when i talk about these people i spoke about time keeping time keeping time keeping so what is this time keeping in india we have got two calendar systems we have got the chandramana calendar system and the sauramana calendar system the chandramana chandra is the word for moon so chandramana means things are dependent on the moon and the sauramana saura is the word for surya which is the sun so based on the movement of the sun we have got the sauramana calendar system so the sauramana calendar system we'll discuss that first which is your basic gregorian calendar system which we fo- uh, follow across the world the sauramana calendars uh, follow the position of the sun with respect to the background stars because we can't see the background stars when there's sun in front of us but you can always do this by calculating what's uh, exactly opposite to the sun so with this we can calculate the position of the sun with respect to 12 zodiac constellations and that is why we have got 12 months even in the gregorian calendar we've got 12 months and this is how we calculate the months according to the sauramana calendar according to the sauramana calendar the month the names are given based on the constellation it is in so uh, the sun enters a constellation around the 20th or 21st of a month so 
uh, from there. So we don't start with the first of the month in India using the Sauramana calendar system. The first day is when the sun has entered a constellation. And then it uh, goes on to move across this constellation for 30 days, 30, 31, a little bit of variation there. And after one month, that is the next 21st, of, I mean, 21st of the next month, according to the Gregorian calendar system, the sun will enter the next constellation. So we have got a new month. So this is the Saurumana calendar system. But majority of Indians will talk about the Chandramana calendar system. The Chandramana calendar system involves the position of the moon with respect to the background stars. So today we, we know uh, something known as the synodic and the sidereal uh, uh, period of the moon, right? So the synodic and the sidereal period of the moon uh, is, is a variation of about 29.5 and 27.3 days. So what is this? So you can look at this image over here. Of course, we all know what a new moon is. We all know what a full moon is. So a new moon is when the moon is in between the Earth and the Sun. So for the moon to go around and come back, it goes across 30 phases. The waxing gibbers, the waning gibbers, the waxing crescent, the waning, and so on and so forth. So it takes 30 days for the moon to go on complete circle. But when it completes this one circle, it will have moved forward by a little amount. And for the moon to come back between the Earth and the Sun, when it reaches this point here, it takes 29.5 days. That is why we have a month that's 30 days long. We call this the synodic month, synodic period of a month. But there's also something very interesting. If you look at the moon with respect to the background stars, so forget the sun, we've got some background stars over here. So today, if the moon is pointing towards a star over here, of course the stars are at infinity. So at this point or at this point, the moon will appear to be, be uh, in front of the same star. So the moon is uh, in front of a star over here. Let's imagine this. And uh, as the moon goes around the Earth, it, it completes one rotation, exactly, geometrically one full rotation, when the moon comes back to the same position in front of the star, right? So what happens is the moon goes around the Earth, and as it does so, the Earth will also move a little bit. And after 27.3 days, the moon will have moved across the Earth and come back to the same position with respect to the background stars. So we can measure the position of the moon with respect to the background stars. That's what we do in India in the Chandramana calendar system. So this brings us to the nakshatra system. In India, we have identified 27 nakshatras. Remember, there's 27 uh, days, 27.9 days in this sidereal month. So 27 nakshatras, one for each day that we can identify. The nakshatras, when I talk about them, of course, today, if you Google what is a nakshatra, it will say a star. But in the astronomical sense in India, a nakshatra is an asterism. It can be one star or a group of stars. So we identified 27 nakshatras. So you can see here, we've got the names, uh, Ashwini, Bharani, Kritika, Rohini, Mragashira, Ardra, Punarvasu. So I've, I've shown you a few names here. And here you've got the star Ashwini in the constellation of Aries. So uh, we know the constellation of Aries in India, we call it the Mesha Rashi. So if you look at the moon, once in 27 days, the moon will be somewhere around this star. So that day, we call it Ashwini. Then uh, I have shown you the word Ardra here. Ardra is the star Betelgeuse. We are very... Uh, it's a very well-known star. So it's a, um, a red star in the constellation of Orion. So Ardra is this star. So some point in this 27-day cycle, the moon will appear near here. And the head of Orion is the Mragashira nakshatra. Rohini is Aldebaran. Kritika is Pleiades. And I mentioned Punarvasu when I was mentioning Ramayana. Ram, Rama was born the day when the moon was near Punarvasu. So this is how we keep track of days. The stars next to the moon. So if I continue this list further, we've got Pushya, Ashlesha, Magha, Pura Falguni, Uttara Falguni, Hasta, Chitra, or Chitta. Again, you can see Magha or Makha Nakshatra is the star Regulus in Leo. So you can see the moon pass by Leo like this. 
and then now we've got falguni in leo also the star chitta is the star spica very famous the bright star in virgo so this is how we keep track of time if i want to complete the list we've also got swati vishakha anuradha jeshta moola purva ashada uttara ashada shravana dhanishta shatavisha uh, purva and uttara bhadrapada and jodi so i've named 27 stars or asterisms but today you can uh, we say when when we talk about nakshatra being an asterism we usually assign the brightest among that asterism to that particular nakshatra so these are the list so here are the modern names of the stars here's the astronomical name of the stars and this is the name of the star in the hip catalog and you've got the indian names whatever i mentioned right now so you've got 27 stars and if you look at it geometrically how the indians actually measured how do you say this uh, this is the nakshatra today it's basically 13 degrees 20 minutes of an arc along the path of the sun or the ecliptic so you've got the path of the sun fixed in the sky that's where we have the 12 zodiac uh, signs and 13 degrees of that path and the moon is within this 13 degrees of this path then it is that nakshatra the next 13 degrees is another nakshatra so with this the moon takes 27 days for this cycle and we have got one month right we call, we call it the chandra masa there is another way to measure the lunar month that is using uh, the full moon and the new moon system so we have got 15 phases of the moon between a full moon and a new moon and then 15 again so total 30 days of a moon's phases that gives us a month so that is also another way of measuring a month so if you look at these names these are the 12 uh, names of the months in india chaitra vaishakha jeshta ashada shravan and so on and so forth and if i show you the nakshatra names there are 27 nakshatras and i can just go on and show you some of these star names and if you look at the month names they will look similar right so you've got uh, chitra here you've got chaitra can you can you identify the similarities you've got vaishakha vishakha jeshta and jeshta they are the same names uh, ashada purva ashada shravana shravana so how do you have these names given basically whenever you have a full moon phase the star nearest to the, to the full moon whatever you have there maybe chitra so if you see the star chitra next to the full moon then it is chaitra masa the next month the moon will go around and around and come back and it will be a full moon because of the 27 29 days difference the full moon will occur when it is near vishakha nakshatra somewhere near in the vicinity that's why shakha masa so this way we've got 12 uh, lunar months in the indian system another uh, important aspect of ancient indian astronomy is the movement of the sun today we call it as the nlm of the sun right the sun appears to move towards the north and towards the south so if you uh, stand facing towards the south or towards the north and look at the sun every single day you will see this pattern the sun will plot an eight along the sky so the sun will appear to move towards the south and then it turns back and moves towards the north we all know this happens because of the earth's axial tilt we've got the march equinox the september equinox the june solstice and the december solstice which is why the sun moves like that because earth itself is tilted and it is going around the sun right but in india there's a uh, there are names and this uh, names given to this movement as well not just equinox and solstice so the equinox is known as a vishuva in india and a solstice is known as ayana in fact uh, when i say ayana we basically there's two meanings to this when i say june solstice we say dakshina ayana and then the time period between june solstice to december solstice is also known as dakshinayana because if you look at the sun or you just look at the sunrise or the sunset you'll see that the sun will appear to move towards the south from june to december you can see here in this images that are clicked you can see beautifully that on june solstice the moon is most towards the north and then next month it has moved little towards the south next month it has moved little towards the south so every single month it moves towards the south until december and then from december it moves towards the north so dakshina ayana means dakshina ayana dakshina means south ayana means movement so the sun moves towards the south june to december dakshina ayana so that six months period is known as dakshina ayana and the sun moves towards the north which is known as uttarayana 
So this is how we can measure. And we celebrate some of these uh, festivals as well. So this you see here is an image or a, a alignment of uh, the March equinox. We celebrate this as the new year in India, the March equinox. Uh, today, because of the precession of the equinox, this has moved into April. So we celebrate the new year from April. This year it was about 12th, 14th. So basically, as the sun goes into various constellations, as it enters into Aries constellation, we believe it's a new year, which is uh, another common thing between India and other countries across the world. So this marks the first day of the year. But today, because of uh, equinox precession, it has moved into Pisces. So when the sun comes, th comes to this point, it's actually equinox, and as the sun enters Aries over here, it's a new year. So it's basically the celebration of the March equinox. Similarly, as the sun enters the constellation of Cancer, we celebrate something known as Makara Sankranti. Remember the word Makara Sankranti, because we're going to use this again. It's a very important holiday in India, because this marks the end of winter. Agriculture begins again. So as the sun enters the constellation of Capricorn, it was the celebration of winter solstice, but today, because of precession of the equinox, this celebration has moved into January. So this year, uh, this celebration was on January 15th. So in India, it might be a little bit confusing if you're an astronomer who, and people say that uh, we celebrated the December solstice in January 15th, but we call it Makara Sankranti, so there's no confusion. So these are the celebrations we have in Indian astronomy. These are the months and the days we have in Indian astronomy. So I've spoken a little bit about ancient uh, astronomy in India. This is a, just the tip of the iceberg, uh, by the way. But let me move on to the uh, future times from there, after the Vedas, what really happened. So in medieval India, we've got uh, many people contributing to astronomical knowledge, contributing to uh, astronomy as a whole. Uh, and many of these were rulers and their uh, court astronomers. So this is an image you saw in the cover pic. Uh, we'll come to this later, but we'll, we'll go chronologically. Uh, of course, because of invasions, India has been a land which has been invaded several times by uh, foreign rulers. Many of these uh, structures do not exist today. So uh, we have very little bit of uh, detail here, but we believe that given the time and the idea behind these structures, there may be a lot, there may have been a lot more of these structures that were meant for astronomical purposes. Uh, first one that we uh, will come across chronologically is the Gyara CD. This was uh, built by Humayun. Humayun was an emperor in the Mughal dynasty. This was built around the 1500s. And the Gyara CD, Gyara CD means 11 stairs. You can see here. This, this has 11 stairs, 11 steps. So the 11 stairs here, the Gyara CV was built as a gnomon. So this was used as a sundial. Uh, we know uh, that the emperor was uh, inspired by the observatory in Uzbekistan. I don't remember the name, but it was very famous. And uh, there's a large gnomon there. And that is what led to this being constructed. What you see here in the background is a small structure that basically tells you, uh, based on the shadow that you see in the date or the time of the year. So this is the Gyara CD built in the Mughal uh, Empire by Humayu. Then we have a very famous temple in India, uh, built in the 1500s. That is the Gavigangadareshwara Temple. This is in Bangalore. And this is a, a very important uh, temple because we, we can see how it was built based on astronomical calculations. Today in modern India, this is how the temple looks. You can see the monoliths here. Uh, today, the buildings have been built around it. We've got uh, construction work and so on. And the temple has been painted and repainted and renovated and so on and so forth. But the monoliths still exist. But what's very important about this temple is that on the day of Makara Sankranti, that is what I told you, is the celebration of the winter solstice. But now, because of the precession of the equinox, this happens on uh, in the month of January, around the 15th of January now. On this precise day, every single year, the alignment on the temple walls are such that the sunlight falls on the shrine of the Shivalinga inside. So we've got an idol for a god inside that is in the form of a Shivalinga. 
and on the day of makara sankranti the light will pass through the walls and align the sun will align perfectly with the structure and the light will fall on the uh, deity and we know the sun keeps moving i just mentioned about uttarayana and dakshinayana it's, it's the same across the world because of this the light will not exactly fall on this idol on any other day so this is a very uh, important uh, observation we have and this is also celebrated in india many people visit the temple on this day to see this happen and it's a marvelous thing that we can we have now that has existed the test of time and then coming to the image that i just showed you a while ago and that's in the cover pic uh, of uh, this program's brochure or the invitation is of the jantar mantra the jantar mantra was built by uh, raja jay singh the second in the 1600s and it is one of uh, it is a very well preserved astronomical uh, instrument that we have seen what you see here is a large park in jantar mantra a small dot here is a human being so that of course the trees are here for scale so you can see how big the instruments are and this is made up of several instruments several structures that are meant for calculations what you see on the cover pic here this is a multiple uh, device embedded into one you have got a gnome on here in the middle that cast shadows even these stairs the walls here cast shadows on to the sides here so you can measure uh, the day the time of the day these act as a sundial you can walk inside and measure the angle of the planets but you've got specific devices like uh, this one right so uh, this is known as the virata yantra virata yantra is basically a giant gnome you can see this structure over here that is the same thing so on the sides you've got arches so as the sun moves from east to west the shadow cast by this giant device will uh, help us measure the time so you got stairs around this arch over here that and markings there so you can measure exactly you can see the stairs over here. so as the sun moves the shadows will move on to this arches here and you will measure uh, the time of the day so this is a very giant sundial that we have then we also have uh, the rama yantra and uh, the jay prakash yantra so the rama yantra here is basically uh, a device used to measure the declination or the altitude of any astronomical body so you stand inside you got a pole in the center over here uh, i should have put a better image but anyways you got a pole over here in the center so you stand here there are markings inside so when you stand at one corner and uh observe the star directly near this giant structure over here you it will form a straight line on the ground and you've got markings on the ground that tell you the declination of planet so you can just google this you'll find this jantar mantra has its own website with a detailed description of these devices but these were built in the 1600s and also jantar mantra is not simply uh, one uh, on uh, what do you say uh, one plot or one point on uh, in india jantar mantar have been built five times in india we've got the jay, uh, jaipur jantar mantar so here's another device that's basically a vertical sundial that's also there in many jantar mantars you've got the virat yantra here the giant gnome on the sundial you've got the uh, jay prakash yantra here again as i showed you earlier so jantar mantar was built in jaipur it was built in varanasi but it was not as grand as the first two ones that we saw you can see here we got small structures over here the nomon is over here uh, it was also built in ujjain ujjain is a very important place in india because it lies uh, uh, very close to the tropic of cancer so uh, that's a very important place for astronomical observations so the ujjain observatory is very important this is the jantar mantra there you got the vertical sundial you got the horizontal or the uh giant sundial that's a gnome moon and the arches to measure the time and then we've also got the one in delhi that i just showed you a while ago the red one the giant one and there was one built in mathura but uh, that was destroyed during invasion so we don't have any structure standing today just ruins so jantar mantra was built five times in india that means indians uh, valued the astronomical measurements it was very important to us so we have built structures around them to measure time to calculate the uh, date and so on and so forth so this is medieval india's contribution uh, again when i say medieval india many of the astronomers or the people who built these devices are kings or their court astronomers and so on and so forth but uh, we don't have specific names that uh, give us 
details, but there's one very important author that is Neelakanta Somayaji from Kerala. He was the one who revised Aryabhata's uh, model, whatever Aryabhata had studied in and written in Aryabhatiya. Neelakanta Somayaji uh, studied it in detail and explained it better. He also mentioned a partially heliocentric model, which is a revision of the geocentric model. Uh, in the West, we know this as the uh, model given by Tycho Brahe or the Tychonic model, where we basically have the Earth at the center and all the planets go around the sun, which goes around the Earth. So, uh, this was a beautiful model that was beautiful imagination in terms of a model. Nila Kanteya Somayaji uh, observed that uh, the planets uh, are better explained if they are going around the sun. But from the Earth's point of view, the sun is still going around the Earth. So this is what they believed in. They gave us the Tychonic model. And he also gave us equations of planetary motion. Uh, this was before Kepler. And this was the most accurate thing we had until Kepler's laws gave us a very precise description of the planetary motion. So before Kep Kepler's laws in India, we had planetary motion uh, defined by Nilakanta Sumanach. And many other co competitions were done by him. So we've covered ancient astronomy, we've co covered the medieval astronomy in India. So uh, let's let's discuss a little bit about the modern astronomy. What is the current scene? Um, when I was talking to the organizers of the program, uh, we were talking about the various astronomy uh, facilities you have in Guatemala and the nearby countries. So in India, uh, astronomy has uh, has been very important as you've seen in the ancient and medieval times. So even the modern scenario of India, we've, we've advanced a lot in astronomy. We've got observatories, we've got uh, premier research institutions. So let me introduce you to them. When we talk about modern Indian astronomers, we speak of three names that are very important. We've got... Uh, Vainu Bapu, uh, we've got Meghanath Saha, who's uh, renowned across the world for the Saha equation. And then we've got Jayant Narlikar, who is also believed to be a genius in India for his contributions to the uh, steady state theory. He was a student of Fred Hoyle. So these are three very important astronomers from uh, India. And uh, to speak a little about the various uh, facilities in India for astronomy, we have. In India, we've got the Astronomical Society of India, which is analogous to the International Astronomical Union. So if you're an astronomer from India, uh, you can be a member here, provided there are certain criteria that, let, uh, that qualify you. This was established in 1972, and they work towards uh, unification of all astronomy activities in India. So all uh, premier research institutes, astronomers, uh, they are a member of this society. And uh, there's, there's uh, frequent conferences Every year, we've got an annual conference, and uh, they have uh, awards and recognitions for various works in astronomy done in India right now. They also release uh, bulletins, and uh, Indians can be members to this as well. And then speaking of uh, institutions, we've got Ayuka, which is the Inter-University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics, located in Pune. It was established in 1988, and this is one of the uh, most premier institutions of astrophysics in India. If you are talking about astronomy or astrophysics in India, somewhere down the line, you'll hear Ayuka as well. Because Ayuka is also uh, responsible for astrophysics research. Uh, it also provides astronomy education through Pune University. It uh, manages certain observatories, and it is largely uh, responsible for popularization of astronomy. So this is the campus of Ayuka. You can see uh, we've got uh, statues of Newton, Einstein, and Aryabhata on campus. It's a very pleasant campus to work in. And uh, the International Astronomical Unit uh, that's actually uh, being set up, that's, uh, I mean, it's in the initial stages right now, the Indian chapter of uh, IAU, exclusive one that's being built in India, uh, is being done through Ayuka. So this is a very important center for astronomy in India. IIA is the second most important institution we have in India. That's the Indian Institute of Astrophysics, located in Bengaluru, started in 1971. They are also a premier. Oh, this is a mistake on my part. I'm really sorry. This is not Pune University. Uh, IIA uh, does activities through astrophysics research. It's a premier institute, I told you. A lot of scientists in IIA uh, are uh, doing cutting edge and very advanced research in astronomy. Uh, it provides astronomy education in the form of uh, MPhil and PhD education. They they are largely responsible for multiple observatories in India. 
which we'll discuss in a while. And of course, they also popularize astronomy in India. So this is the campus. Okay, This is not, uh, Pune University is a mistake there. The PhD you get from IAA is from Pondicherry University. So this is the campus in Bangalore uh, that anyone can visit. Then we have one of the, uh, another premier institutes in India, that is the Aryabhata Research for uh, Institute for Observational uh, Sciences. We call this ARIES. Uh, as the constellation. This is located in Nainital. Uh, this was started in 1954. And uh, they also, it's a premier institute, so there's astrophysics research going on. And they have their own observatory there in Nainital. So you can see here in this image, they've got multiple uh, telescopes there. I'll discuss in a while. They're also responsible for astronomy popularization. They've got, uh, these, these were uh, exclusively astrophysics institutes. Then we have the Tata Institute for Fundamental Research. A large part of this uh, institute is doing astronomy research in India. This is located in Mumbai, uh, in established in 56, and they do a lot of research in mathematics and physics as well. But uh, TIFR has contributed largely to radio astronomy scene in India. So this is the campus in Bombay. And then you've got uh, the TIFR's center in Pune, that's the National Center for Radio Astrophysics. They do radio astronomy research and uh, control a lot of observation arrays. Then we've got the Raman Research Institute. Raman is quite famous across the world. He is the only Indian to have won the Nobel Prize in uh, physics, uh, being in India, having studied in India. Uh, so he uh, started this institute in 1948 in Bengaluru. And this is, again, a research institute where a part of it, a major part of it, is contributing to Indian astronomy. They manage a lot of observatories and so on. Right? Then finally, we've got the, the youngest of these all, the Indian Institute for Space Science and Technology. This is located in Tiruvananthapuram. And uh, this offers undergraduate and uh, graduate studies. And this has a focus on space science as well, because uh, ISRO, the Space Organization of India, is uh, uh, largely collaborated with them. So there's more of space research and also astronomy research. Along with these premier research institutes in India, of course, we've got about 1,000 universities in India. Uh, many of these, uh, along with these universities, we've got uh, premier research institutes like the ones I've just told you. And then we have the Indian Institute of Science, which is located in Bengaluru. We've got the Indian Institute of Technology, which is, um, there are many of these in many of these states. We've got the Indian Institute for Scientific, uh, Science, Education and Research, ICER. Uh, we've got uh, eight, uh, sorry, seven ICERs across India. Then we've got the Physical Research Laboratory, all of which have an astronomy department or uh, astronomy research units. And then I told you, 1,000 universities in India, many of them are central universities by government, and there are state universities. Many of them have uh, departments with the astronomical studies or professors in astronomy who offer, and they have courses uh, that offer astronomy studies as well. And finally, uh, as we have discussed the Institute, I told you some of them manage the like IA and TIFR, they manage observatories in India. So in all of India contains so many observatories. We've got uh, in the northernmost part of India, we've got some very pristine skies. So we've got observatories there. We've got infrared observatories in India. We've got solar observatories and radio observatories in India as well. So let me just walk through all of these quickly. Uh, Aries that I told you in Nenitan has the Devasthal Observatory. That's the mountain that I just showed you they have multiple devices. They have a solar telescope. They have a 3.6 meter optical telescope, a large one, a 1.3 meter large telescope, and a 104 centimeters, uh, that's 1.04 meters telescope as well, right? So this is the uh, mountain on which it's located. So you can see there are multiple observatories here. And then the 3.6 Devastel telescope is the latest edition. It's cutting edge. A research uh, telescope here. This is the observatory that you see, and this is the telescope inside. Then we've got the Ayuka's uh, Girwali telescope, Girwali Pune. It is a two meter optical telescope, and it's got a uh, very advanced spectrograph and a camera. So this is the observatory there, and this is the telescope inside. Then we've got the Vainubaku observatory, uh, one of the oldest observatories in India. Initially, they had a 38 centimeter optical telescope that you see here. This is located in Kavalur, Karnataka. And today they have a 30 inch tel uh, optical telescope and a 2.3 meter uh, telescope, which is mostly used for deep sky observations. Uh, this observatory has been responsible uh, for many deep sky objects, star clusters, variable stars, 
uh, so on and so forth. In fact, there's an anecdote that explains how uh, the rings of Uranus were actually discovered in this uh, observatory as well. So this is the uh, modern telescope uh, structure they have right now. Then we've got the Indian Astronomical Observatory in Hanle, Ladakh. I told you, uh, Himalayan skies in Ladakh are some of the driest and the clearest skies we have got. Uh, these are bottle one skies, so some very pristine skies that we can observe the sky with. And at Hanle, managed by the IIA, we've got the uh, Himalayan Chandra telescope, that's a 2.1 meter optical infrared telescope. Then we've got the Growth India telescope. It's a collaboration between several countries and it's a 0.7 meter optical telescope that is completely robotic. We control these telescopes from South India in Bengaluru, uh, which is controlled by IAA. And uh, the one at Hanle is actually the 10th highest optical telescope in the world. The Himalayan Chandra telescope is the 10th highest optical telescope in the world. This is the image we have. Another small part of uh, uh, IAA is the Hadar, uh, uh, it's the Hadar array or the high altitude, Hagar, sorry, Hagar array, that's high altitude gamma ray observatory. It's basically a Cherenkov uh, experiment telescope. So there are seven of these telescopes spread over uh, the region and the total area covered by them is 4.4 meters squared. So by all the telescopes combined. So this is an image. We've got several telescopes here uh, spread across the region. And this is the structure. So we've got uh, various uh, telescopes forming a structure here. You see each of these telescope has uh, multiple uh, collectors, right? So this is the individual. Then we've got the Pachmahi telescope array uh, in Madhya Pradesh. It's an array of 24 gamma ray telescopes, just like the one at Hanle. Uh, this is managed by TIFR and this is the uh, structure. Uh, it's not a very clear image. So you see multiple telescopes over here. Each of these telescopes contains of seven mirrors like this in this format. So this is how we have the gamma ray observatories in India. Then we've got radio observatories, that is the Gauri Vidnu Radio Observatory managed by two institutions together. They have a six meter radio telescope. It's a decameter wave radio uh, telescope. So we measure of the wavelength of a decameter. And this telescope is a radio telescope. So what you see here when you go there is a 1.4 kilometer wide, 0.5 kilometer uh, tall telescope, right? So point tall as in on the ground. So these are the uh, antennas of the telescope. You can see uh, 1.4 kilometers east to west and north south it's 0.5 kilometers. So if you look at it completely, this is the structure that you'll see. It's spread across the region, right? Then we've got the OT's radio telescope by managed by uh, TIFR. Uh, it's actually 530 of these 30 meter cylindrical parabolic antennas, right? So you've got parabolic antennas like this. There's 530 of these. And you see a faint white light over here. That is because these dishes are made with uh, steel wires. So there are steel wires here. They are reflecting sunlight. So you can see this. And they are, <coughs> sorry, they're spread across a uh, long region, 530 of these that are used for radio observations. And then uh, as we move towards the conclusion, we've got the giant meter wave radio telescope. That's 30 uh, telescopes, each of 45 meter in uh, diameter. That's like this. Each of these telescopes are like this. And the entire array looks like this. Okay, this is managed by NCR at AIFR. We've got solar observatories in India. So the Kodaikanal Observatory in India has a 15 centimeter uh, refractor. That's heliostatic, so it's observing the sun all the time. And they also have a smaller 20 centimeter telescope for observations in the night. And uh, they observe in K alpha and H alpha lines, so on and so forth. So this is the observatory they have. This is the uh, heliostatic observatory they have. Then we've got the Udaipur Solar Observatory. This is also a very uh, important observatory. This is managed by PRL, Physical Research Laboratory. And it's a 50 centimeter uh, telescope. And it's actually very interesting. The observatory is located uh, amidst the land mass of water. So this is how it looks. You've got a lake around it, right? So that makes a good uh, condition for the solar observatory to observe the sun. 
then speaking a little bit about infrared astronomy in india we've got the mount abu telescope that's a infrared uh, telescope of 1.2 meter in diameter and then we've also got a small uh, optical telescope there for uh, night sky observations right so this is the observatory it's on top of mount abu and speaking of all the observatories in india we have today in the future we have the uh, ligo collaboration with india we call it indigo the india initiative for gravitational wave observatories this is in maharashtra and uh, it's uh, uh, it's almost functional it's they are doing research there uh, might be full swing in a while then we've got the india based neutrino observatory in tamil nadu that's located underground uh, that's 1.3 kilometers underground and 2 kilometers uh, in length right and then we've got the national large solar telescope that's going to come up at hand so all of these telescopes observatories and premier institutions are managed by the current modern indian astronomers now uh, we've got govind swaroop here uh, he was instrumental in building the radio telescopes in india and uh, we've got ajit kembavi and uh, dadich here naresh dadich here who were uh, the initial directors of ayuka along with jayant narlikar whom i've shown you earlier then we've got uh, uh, tanu padmanabhan who just passed away uh, the previous this year uh, these were very uh, important astronomers and then the astronomy fraternity in india is very large this image you see here is of the recent conference of the astronomical society of india where all the astronomers in india combined come to one place and discuss astronomy so you can see there's a large number of people doing astronomy in india uh, and finally just to make out uh, make astronomy reach to people we have got planetarium spread across india we have got the nehru centers in um, mumbai delhi bangalore we've got regional science center like here in karnataka we've got one in lucknow we've got uh birla centers uh, like in kolkata and hyderabad that popularize astronomy uh, that bring students closer to astronomy and guide them towards research in astronomy and some of uh, important people uh, in the, on this path you can see here uh, we've got gt narayan rao we've got uh, balchandra rao we've got ratna shri who was the director of uh, the delhi uh, planetarium we've got shailaja who was the director of uh, uh, bangalore planetarium we've got uh, aravind paranjpe who is currently the director of mumbai planetarium we've got uh, aniket sule here and so many people and these are just a few names that i'm mentioning so many people are involved in popularizing astronomy as well so in india astronomy is a complete package we've got uh, a rich heritage we've got uh, a history we've got uh, mythologies we've got literature uh, in the medieval times people built astronomies uh, centers we've got observatories some of which are destroyed unfortunately today so and then even in the modern times uh, india has got state of the art observatories we've got a research so many things are happening in terms of astronomy in india and uh, as i'm presenting this to other part of the world india also welcomes uh, people from abroad to study in india in many of the universities i mentioned we have got international students uh, pursuing their uh, education and research in astronomy in india so with that i would like to conclude this session hope i have uh, given you enough details about astronomy in india uh, thank you thank you thank you thank you very much professor atul thank you very much for your enlightening conference lecture and your and of course very illustrative and very understandable we have a lot of a lot of questions questions are raining here for you so <laughs> let me first let me thank you for this comprehensive and very interesting lovely uh, lecture very nice So uh, we have some uh, questions um the first question that i have is do you as astronomers follow the astronomical union rules and norms uh, yes uh, we uh, currently the modern astronomy uh, follows the international norms we've got 
the IAU giving us the 88 constellations and uh, all of that is being followed in India. Uh, what I mentioned about the uh, heritage of India that has been studied in detail, but today we know that all the latest calculations and uh, uh, things given to us by IAU are to be relied upon and uh, we, we follow the uh, modern uh, system as well. So all the Indian international standards are followed. Okay, so you have both. You have uh, the international astronomy uh, norms and standards. Yes. And your, and your cultural. Yes. Uh, okay. Well, very, very interesting. Um, the astronomer, you mentioned astronomy Aryabhata. The, yes. uh, he had a model of astronomy that was geocentric. Yes. From the beginning, uh, so you had uh, also any heliocentric models before? before? Uh, yes, there have been many uh, models like this, uh, but I, like I told you, many of them are lost in uh, time due to invasions and India had this very uh, sad uh, habit of not writing things down. So most of the things that I've mentioned are uh, basically uh, passed on from one generation to the other. And uh, we really didn't write things down. We don't have scriptures. And the ones that have survived, ones that give us clear pictures, uh, are these, the Arya Bhatiya and the little bit by Bhaskara and Baraha Mehra. Uh, and like I told you, Arya Bhatta in his book, although the mentions are from the Earth perspective, there is a debate going on that some of these aspects are only possible uh, if you see the heliocentric picture of the universe. So uh, there is a small part of it that makes us believe that he also knew the heliocentric theory, but then we don't know. We don't know what really was there and all we have is the text and most of the things in the text uh, lean towards the geocentric part. And that is the belief uh, here. You were, you had the, helio, the geocentric model be, before Galileo in, in Europe. Uh, it was uh, or Copernicus were promoting this this model, this geocentric model. Yes, yes. From very ancient times, uh, you had a geocentric model. I I believe so because uh, across the world it it appeared to be the same. Even when you look at uh, the night sky, everything seems to be going around us. So it takes some of the sharpest minds to figure out. Uh, no, we are not at the center, looking at the retrograde motion, looking at how Venus and Mercury are never high up in the sky. So most of the observations we have, we, we do not have a, <coughs> sorry, we do not have a model uh, presented as such until we have got it in Aryabhata, Aryabhatiya. So I told you, uh, Surya Siddhanta uh, mentions these things. They don't mention a model as such. We are more concerned with the timekeeping. We are more concerned with the position of the moon and the sun in our skies because large part of these uh, observations were meant for ritualistic purposes. So uh, given that you also have a rich history in uh, Mayas and Incas, you also know that astronomy contributed a lot to rituals and uh, it, it decided the time for certain rituals. So we were mostly concerned with that. When you had a scientific text like uh, Surya Siddhanta and Aryabhatiya, there's a little bit of mention because uh, they don't really care how Venus, I mean, uh, why Venus is uh, appearing only near the sun all the time. Why is it never up in the sky? And there's a very few scientific texts like Surya Siddhanta that try to explain this. And uh, that's, that's where we have the mention of the planets going around the earth or the planets going around uh, the sun, like I told you. Uh, Bhaskara mentioned the uh, Tychonic model. So he was keen in observing uh, that the planets go around the sun, not the earth. But the sun to him appeared to be going around the earth. Uh, we don't have a mention of uh, a geocentric or a heliocentric theory because uh, in the Vedas, you'll come across people claiming that in the Vedas, they mention of the universe as a whole. So uh, it's, it's a abstract picture. And the only precise data we have is from Aryabhatiya and Surya Siddhanta. So there's there's a mention of both geocentric and heliocentric. As long as the rituals went well with it, uh, they were not concerned much. 
Thank you. <clears throat> There's another question here that says, I found a great harmony between the scientific calculations and religion beliefs, but did the astronomy history in India had periods of darkness like Christians had church against science long ago? Uh, in India, there might have been uh, times like this, which we don't know about as they are lost in history. But uh, when I speak of the Vedic period, in India, we've got uh, certain groups that were atheists themselves, that were skeptics themselves. We've got the Charvakas, we've got uh, the Nastikas and so on and so forth. So each one had their own view. And uh, so far from what we have in history, most of the rulers have been uh, liberal when it comes to religion and people's beliefs. That is why in India, we've got two calendars, the solar and the lunar calendar. People were free to believe whatever they wanted to until it was the time of the uh, Islamic invasions that we had from Persia, who started demolishing uh, the, the monuments, the culture, and uh, rewriting history as such. So during that time, we might have lost a lot of knowledge, but uh, so far from our knowledge, we don't have any opposition as such in ancient times at least towards uh, religious beliefs and science. Um, most of the efforts in India have been to uh, integrate both of them. So like I told you, ritualistic purposes, we've got astronomical calculations. So they were always uh, going in hand to hand. And whenever they did not match a certain philosophy, people were free to uh, follow their own path. And uh, to tell you a small example of this, uh, there are multiple calendars of the lunar version itself. There are multiple uh, regions in India that believe that the new moon day is the first day of the month. And there are uh, multiple uh, regions that believe the full moon day is the first day of the month. Uh, here, wherever I teach in Purna Pranya, uh, College, it, it, it's in Udupi. So there they believe uh, the solar months, they don't follow the lunar months but they follow the lunar days, the faces of the moon. So India is a, a mixture of all of these beliefs. And uh, we don't uh, recall any of uh, uh, dark periods as such. The only dark periods we have are when the knowledge was lost because it was not written down or because of invasions. There was never a conflict between uh, religion and science as such. It was always an effort to integrate them. We've got cosmological theories as well. We know how the universe... I mean, uh, they knew how for themselves how the universe uh, began and it ended, and it never conflicted with religious belief. They always tried to put things together. So there was no dark periods as such. Uh, there's always a harmony, as it was mentioned in the question. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> there's. Uh, I'm, go I'm going to continue here with uh, another question. Uh, are the janter uh, Janter Mantar observatories, solar observatories, and are they uh, in use today? Uh, they aren't used today because we've got precise calculations and calendars right now that we follow. We follow the Gregorian calendar uh, as well. But yes, uh, Jantar Mantar were largely uh, solar observatories, but there were uh, the vertical uh, <clears throat> and the dials, the gnomons that were mentioned that I, I, I showed in one of the images that could also trap shadows of the moon. So it was believed to be calculating times at night as well. Although uh, I don't think it was possible to do it, do it during the new moon night. But I think it was mostly meant for measuring and giving out uh, the duration of certain periods. So whenever you have a full moon, you do these measurements and give these times and uh, but most of the devices that I've mentioned there, uh, the gnomon that you saw, the Ramayantra and so on and so forth, they were for solar observations. But that pillar that I showed you there, the, cylind the two cylinders with the pillar in between, those were meant for declination. So you could use them against the stars as well. You would need a uh, light to see the inscriptions on the structure to know the declination, but you can use them at night. You can use, it's a 360 degree device. If it was solar, it would have been a simple, uh, a sundial kind of a structure, but it's a 360 degree device, which means I would use it to see the pole star as well. I would use it to see other stars as well. So uh, the Jantar Mantar, that the structure that I showed you, the, the red one in Delhi, 
Uh, it's a combination of both solar and uh, lunar observations. Whereas the other structures that we saw in Ujjain and uh, Jaipur, they had largely uh, solar uh, measurements to do that. Oh, yes, we are. We're um, amazed with all the observatories that you have. And um, we wonder how are the climate conditions for astronomical observations in India? Okay. Uh, climate conditions and astro uh, astronomical conditions in India, uh, it's not very favorable throughout the year. Uh, I mentioned we've got the pristine skies in the Himalayas, uh, the Ladakh region, the Spiti Valley have the clearest skies, but India is a large country. We've got a tropical part at the lower end, we've got mountainous regions, we've got plains and so on and so forth. So the climate varies from place to place. Uh, where I live, we get about uh, two months of unobstructed skies uh, in the month of November and December. And in between, it may be cloudy. We've got a rainy season in between. I'm sure uh, you live in the similar latitude, so you'll be familiar with the weather there. And uh, we've got summer months, but uh, we've got light pollution. I also saw one of the questions had light pollution. Light pollution is a very important problem in India. Uh, we don't have the clearest skies uh, for a large part of India. At the same time, we've got two regions in India that have the most, the clearest skies in all of the world. The Himalayan region, the Spiti Valley have bottle one skies. And even in Karnataka, the state where I live, uh, there's a place called Yana in Sirsi. Uh, they've got some of the clearest pristine skies. But in the winter months, we've got also the problem of fog. So there's dew in the sky. So it, it, it's, it's difficult to observe many things. So the observatories are located on top of mountains and all of these things to overcome these issues. As an amateur astronomer, you get about two to three months of pure uh, astronomical observation uh, months that favor them. And then in between, you have to wait for the clouds to clear. And the rainy season is the time between June to around September is uh, not a window at all because it's it's cloudy all the time. In between, uh, we've got uh, favorable windows in between. But right now, because of the unpredictable weather patterns, we are suffering a lot. Uh, probably because of global warming, we've got unexpected rains, unannounced rains. Uh, unannounced, unannounced clouds and cyclones, so it's it's causing a lot of problems for the astronomy observations. All right. Yes. And talking about the uh, amateur astronomers, are there uh, I guess thousands of clubs, thousands yes. of <laughs> oh, uh, clubs uh, are all along uh, India, right? Yes. Yes. Wherever you have a uh, astronomy. Uh, education or a research happening, there is, of course, a club that's going on there. Uh, there are clubs that are uh, open to public. There are clubs by science centers. Uh, we've got a large number of science centers and museums uh, across India. They all have their uh, astronomy clubs. So we've got a large number of astronomy clubs in India. Some of them are very exclusive. That's a membership model only for that institute, only for that kind of a region. Uh, a club like ours that I've mentioned is open to everyone. Anyone can join. There are clubs for cities also. Like uh, here in Mangalore, we've got amateur uh, astronomers of Mangalore. Uh, Mangalore amateur astronomers is what we call it, MA. <coughs> Sorry. There's one in Bangalore as well. In Bangalore, you've got um, um, uh, Bangalore Astronomical Society. So a lot of people, uh, people you're familiar with also are members of that. Uh, club and they do a lot of astronomy activities. So astronomy outreach is a very important thing in India. And uh, does the government uh, support astronomy in uh, in the higher level? Oh yes, uh, the the premier institutes that I told you are all under the government of India. Uh, all the institutes like PRL, uh, IIA, IUCA are all managed or at least funded by the government of India. Uh, very few of these institutions are private, uh, owned by individuals. And uh, I showed you the list of IITs, the Indian Institute of Technology, the central universities, the state universities. These are all funded by the government of India. Oh. Uh, so India, the government plays a large role in establishing these centers, these observatories, and so on and so forth. Wow, this is very, very good. 
Very good. You have the good support from the government. And uh, there is another question here for specific for LIGO. The, the project uh, of LIGO India continues is the construction of the Hingoli district in Maharashtra continues? Yes. yes. Uh, it is, I am I'm not uh, really aware of the latest development there, but uh, in Hingoli, we are setting up uh, gravitational wave detector projects. There have been, a, uh, the research has already started. There are small detectors there that are being done. And I think the, the complete scale is yet to be established. Uh, I think a, I think someone can just Google it and get the data there. I am not very, uh, very up to date with the news there. All right, thank you. And uh, last question. <clears throat> last question because you, we don't have, we don't want to take more a lot of time from from yours. But it is it has been very interesting. Um, what uh, you showed us uh, a lot of uh, observatories and telescopes. What is the largest uh, telescope that India has? Uh, the largest telescope, I think, optical, was the uh, optical telescope. Yes, uh, that is what telescopes, infrared telescopes, X-ray yes. telescopes, <laughs> yes, yes. telescopes, and observatories. Correct. So uh, I think the largest that I mentioned was uh, the Devasthal telescope. I mean, at Nainital by Aries, uh, that was a three point six meter uh, uh, telescope. Uh, the Hanley one, uh, that is a two meter telescope. So Devasthal is a large telescope there. And I am not sure if I mentioned it. Uh, at Aries in Devasthal, they're actually building the liquid mirror telescope. So uh, that is being built right now. So that observe, that's a, a liquid that's being rotated and because of centrifugal force, it forms a uh, parabolic nature and we can observe the stars at Zenith. Uh, that I think is going to be very large. But optically, we've got the Devasthal telescope that's uh, uh, three, 3.6 meters. Oh. Uh, when it comes to gamma ray observations, uh, the one, the Hagar, the one I mentioned there at Hanle, uh, that's the uh, gamma ray observatory in Ladakh, uh, high altitude gamma ray observatory, that is actually uh, a large uh, region that observes a large thing. And then uh, uh, when it comes to radio telescopes, I think the 30 meter telescope is the biggest because it's a large, large array that I showed you. Uh, it's, uh, I think it was 45 meters was each dish and you had uh, multiple of those dishes that uh, formed the image. So the giant meter wave telescopes, uh, that's not the 30 meters, sorry, the giant meter wave, uh, giant meter wave telescope, 30 of those 45 meter radio telescopes, the collecting area was 47,000 meters squared. So, that's the largest uh, uh, radio telescope we have. Uh, infrared, I, uh, we we had only one observatory, that was the Mount Abu Observatory. Uh, that's a dedicated infrared observatory. And then uh, solar observatory, uh, it's the Udaipur uh, Observatory that had a 50 centimeter uh, uh, heliostatic uh, sensor. So that was the largest. Um, you mentioned many names in astronomy and astrophysics. The name that we are most familiar is uh, Subrama, 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 Subramaniam Chandrasekhar. Chandrasekhar, yes, yes. because yes. of the Chandrasekhar limit. Yes, we study that in the uh, in stellar revolution, yes. holes, right? So yes. it's the uh, prominent. Figure. It is a prominent name, but I did not mention it because uh, Chandrasekhar was in the United States. Uh, he did his research and his study there in the United States. Yeah. Uh, all the names I mentioned might have studied abroad, but they are working in India. Oh, so if I they see. win a Nobel Prize tomorrow, it will be a Nobel Prize for India. Okay. <laughs> all right. I understand. All right. Okay. Well, I am have nothing but uh, thank you for your excellent lecture here this uh, night uh, for us, morning for you. And we appreciate very much your time and your enthusiastic talk. Uh, 
we know that we can be mem become members of your astronomy club and uh, maybe you will get some many requests for Guatemalan <laughs> members in your club <laughs> from yes, now on. That would be wonderful. We hope that. So thank you very much for your time and uh, your you. good disposition. And thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. I have spoken to people across the world for the first time. So people have been li uh, listening to this. So it's, it's a great opportunity. Thank you so much. It's been a milestone for us to thank you. Hey, voy a, uh, I'm going to change to Spanish. Yes, yeah. no problem. Voy a cambiar para, para despedirme. Este ha sido para nosotros una, una maravillosa charla, eh, realmente muy bonita, ilustrativa, eh, hermosa charla que nos dejó cultura y ciencia y sorpresas, porque la verdad no conocíamos mmm, casi nada de la astronomía en India. Y ha sido muy ilustrativa gracias al profesor Atul Bhatt. Eh, les agradecemos a todos su presencia y les invitamos a seguir con el programa de charlas y conferencias que estamos teniendo, vamos a tener dos astrónomos más o tres astrónomos de la India que van a continuar dando charlas y esperamos también tener otras sorpresas en el futuro. Muchas gracias por acompañarnos y que estén muy bien. Que pasen buena noche y se cuidan. Thank you. Thank you. And Muchas bye -bye. gracias. Thank you.